Evening, everybody. My name is Jim Walker, the pastor of Revival from Down Under in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, which is in Australia. Uh, tonight I'm going to speak on a, a topic which I've called My Undefiled. My Undefiled. Uh, I'm going to begin in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 where the Apostle Paul tells us we are to study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Hallelujah. If we go into Romans chapter 15 And in verse 4 it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. And uh, if you did a study on the correlation of the New Testament, you'll find the New Testament wasn't correlated until about 170, 175 A.D. And so, the, the, the New Testament books were based upon that which was written in the Old Testament. All right, so the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, Apostle Peter, they used scripture from the Old Testament because the New hadn't been written. So the things that are written aforetime being Old Testament scripture. Amen? Paul also tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and in verse 16, he says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So all scripture, that's Old and New Testament, has been given by God and is profitable for doctrine, that is teaching. It is profitable for doctrine. Reproof is evidence of and conviction. That's what the word reproof means, evidence and conviction for correction that is when we are, uh, if we may have wrongly, uh, if we may have wrongly divided the word, and then somebody comes along and brings out scriptures showing, you know, that this is how the word is, this is what the word's saying, and it brings a, an adjustment, it brings a correction of error. And it's for instruction in righteousness. So all scripture is for instruction in righteousness. It then says in verse 17 that the man of God may be perfect. The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, that word perfect means, comes from a Greek word meaning complete means complete. All right, so the purpose of all scripture or the purpose of preaching from all scripture is to make us complete. If we are not being taught from all scripture and we are not using all scripture to teach, then the people that we are teaching or we who are not being taught, can't be complete. It is impossible to be complete without the understanding of all scripture. The word thoroughly furnished means to be equipped as a teacher. So the purpose of the word of God is to make us complete, equipping us equivalent to a teacher. Amen? Glory to God. You got that?
Hallelujah. So, this teaching tonight is regarding my undefiled. And when we study scripture, we find that God's undefiled is the bride of Christ. It is bride. And we need to study from all scripture to get the full revelation of what God is saying concerning his undefiled, his bride. Amen? And so if we, uh, if we go into Psalm 119, in Psalm 119 and verse 1, it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is all the word. It's all scripture is the law of the Lord. And so they that walk in all scripture, they are going to be blessed. That's what the word of the Lord says. They will be blessed and they will be undefiled. That word undefiled also means sincere. Sincere, they will be sincere and perfect. And perfect. And so we have just read that the purpose of all scripture is to make us perfect, to fully equip us. Amen? And so if, if we... If we didn't teach from all scripture, I wouldn't be teaching you from this, from this particular verse and you wouldn't know any better. You wouldn't know what God's requirement is. Amen? Glory to God. This word undefiled means perfect, sincere, upright, and the main two words I want to pick up on is without spot or blemish and it means complete. To be complete. Without spot, blemish, to be complete. And so I'm emphasizing again them three words. Without spot, without blemish, <coughs> complete. Amen? Now the word... The next two scriptures, I trans the, the, the word undefiled in these next two scriptures come from the same Hebrew word as what we've just read. And so if we go over into Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon, and chapter 5, and in verse 2 it says, if you, if you study Song of Solomon, it's mainly speaking of the Bride of Christ. It's all about the Bride of Christ and the Bridegroom and the Bride of Christ. And so here, this verse is no different. It says, I sleep, but my heart wakes. It is the voice of my beloved that knocks, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love. My dove, my undefiled. So here Jesus is saying, the bridegroom, open to me, my dove, my undefiled. Okay? My dove, my undefiled. Glory. Speaking of the bride of Christ. If I read that verse from the Amplified Bible, It says, I went to sleep, but my heart stayed awake. I dreamed that I heard the voice of my beloved as he knocked at the door of my mother's cottage. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my spotless one. My spotless one. All right, so again, the... Instead of using undefiled, it uses the word 
spotless one, because that's actually what it means, spotless, without spot. Amen? If we go into Song of Solomon, chapter 6, and verse 8 says, 8 through 8 and 9, there are three score queens, four score concubines, and virgins without number. My dove, my undefiled, is but one of them. My undefined, my dove, is but one. So there are many virgins, etc. But Christ's bride is only one of them and she will be chosen from amongst the virgins. These virgins, um, virgins can speak of Christians and um, can also speak of churches and there are many churches there are many virgins and but not all have got the revelation of who's going to be is undefiled and not all understand that many of them will miss out they'll not be a part of the they'll not be a part of the bride group they will make it some will make it to the wedding feast and others will miss out altogether. All right, some will make it to the wedding feast, some will miss out altogether. They will not even get into the wedding feast. The Amplified Bible says of this, these verses, verse, verse 8, there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number, but my dove, my undefiled and perfect one, my undefiled and perfect one. Hallelujah. Now we've already read in, in, first, in, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17, that the perfection that God requires cannot be possibly achieved without the teaching from all Scripture. It's impossible. And God has raised is God in these last days will raise up ministries, the ones spoken of in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. They will, God will raise them up. And if you study them verses, they bring the saints to perfection. The perfection required to be undefiled. So it's not only is it brought about by the teaching of the word, but it's also brought about by these five ministries. Preaching the fullness of the word of God. Amen? Preaching the fullness of the word of God. Glory to God. If we go into James, and chapter 1, in verse 27 it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. So if you keep yourself unspotted from the world and what, what goes on in the world, right? If you keep yourself unspotted, you will be undefiled in God's eyes. Now, as we continue to study, we will find we will find out that wearing the wrong clothing or wearing, wearing clothing that is, that doesn't, um, what's the wording used in Timothy? Um, modest. modest. 
the word modest clothing, if we don't wear modest clothing according to the word of God, that does not make you undefiled. Clothing does not defile you. Some are preaching that if, if ladies wear pants, they won't go to heaven. That is a load of rubbish. It's not scriptural when you study rightly dividing the word. Clothing cannot defile you. It's what's in your heart and what comes out of your mouth defiles you. And we find that by studying the word. Amen? And we'll see that in a minute. This word unspotted, used by James, comes from the Greek word aspilos. The same Greek word used in Ephesians chapter 5, go there, Ephesians chapter 5. The same Greek word. And verse 27, that he might present the church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or blemish, or any such thing. So here, this is talking about the church. God wants his church to be without spot, wrinkle, to be undefiled, and then only those that are totally without spot, wrinkle, and blemish, those that are undefiled, they're the ones that will be presented to Christ to be his bride. The rest, as I said before, they will either go into the wedding as wedding guests or they will be shut out altogether and won't make it in at all. Hallelujah. Amen? Do you understand that? The same word. And this is why we have to study to find out what these words mean so that we can rightly divide the word. In James chapter 3, Reading from verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. And we know at this very present time, there is no one yet perfect. So he's speaking, anybody who thinks they're perfect, they're not. They're deceiving themselves. The same is perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us. And we turn about the whole body. Behold also ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, Yet are they turned about with a very little small helm, whithersoever the governor lists. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold, how great the tongue, a little, a matter, a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body. So you t it's your tongue that defiles you. And it defiles you by the words you speak. Are you listening to this? It's not the clothing or anything else. It's what comes out of your belly. It's what comes out of your heart through your mouth that defiles you. Hallelujah. 
Amen. In Jude chapter 12, sorry, Jude verse 12. <coughs> in Jude verse 12, it starts, it's talking about people. If you go back into verse 1, 2 and, and read up to verse 12, it's talking about people. All right? And these people are people that have gone astray from the truth. They've heard the truth. They've been in the truth. But they've gone astray from the truth. And they start, they start speaking against the truth. And it says in verse 12, these are spots in your feast of charity. They are spots in your feast of charity. Now, what is the feast of charity? Feast of charity is communion. So, these people are in church taking communion with you and they are spots. And we need to recognise them. And how do we recognise them? By what they speak. The way they act, what they do, but mainly by what they speak. It's how you know spots and blemishes. Amen? Glory to God. In verse 23 it says, And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now we have been given a garment of salvation. Now many preach that we are already righteous. Well, when I study scripture, I find that is not so. We are becoming the righteousness of God. We will be the righteousness of God as the word of God works on our heart. And we just read in 1 Corinthians, and sorry, in 2, in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, that all scripture is for teaching in righteousness to bring us to the righteousness of God. The same righteousness as he is. But it can only be done through the teaching of all scripture. Amen. Glory to God. So, I do not believe yet we have been given the garment of salvation. Sorry, the garment of, uh, the, the robe of righteousness. But we have been given the garment of salvation. And we can make that garment of we By what comes out of here and what we do, because of our, what's in our hearts, it can defile us and it can spot our garment. It can make our garment spotted. When we first get given a garment of salvation, we are clean. When we first get saved, we're pure before God. But because we're still in the world, the world affects us. And the thing that the world does affects us, if we let it affect us. But sometimes when we're young Christians in, in God, we don't know any different. And we do things we shouldn't do. And when we do that, when we're told about it, what we're doing is wrong. If we repent, we're spotless again. We're clean again. But you're only clean when you repent. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The works of the flesh that spot your garment in, in Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul tells us what the works of the flesh is. I'll, I'll start in verse 16. It says, then I, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, we've got to be walking God's ways. God's ways is an undefiled way. God's way is not the way of the flesh. Because we're told in Romans, they that do the works of the flesh, 
They're not the children of God. Hallelujah. And it says, the wages of sin, the works of the flesh is sin, and the wages of sin is death. So it carries on, it says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. There is a contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are these, are manifest. Which are these? Adultery is a work of the flesh. Fornication, uncleanness. And some of the words have been, the Greek words always also take you into that, that um, uh, if you're not, if you're not undefiled, you're unclean. If you're, if you're not pure, you're unclean. If you're not spotless, you're unclean. And so he's saying here, no unclean. Lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, craft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in part time past, that they which do such things, they that do the works of the flesh, they that think the works of the flesh, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it says. Amen. Now, there are, Paul mentioned that also in 1 Corinthians 6. It's also mentioned in Romans. It's also mentioned in Colossians. They that do the works of the flesh, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So, this once saved, always saved teaching is off the planet wrong. People are teaching it because they're wrongly dividing the word. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now if we go uh, into Matthew 15, Jesus also speaks of the works of the flesh. Because he uses the same things in these verses as Paul does in Galatians. So he's talking about the works of the flesh. I'll read uh, verse 11. Not that which goes into your mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth defiles a man. So it's not what you put in, it's not what you wear, it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. I agree scripturally that we should be uh, modest, but what does that modesty mean? Many preach that based on Old Testament and we have one amongst us at the moment that does so, that a woman shouldn't wear pants. I don't know what they wore in them days, but I know it says men should not wear what women wear, and women shouldn't wear what men wear. But when you come into the New Testament, we find things change a bit. And we find that, we find that, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if we go to there, he talks about effeminates in, verse, in chapter 6, verse 9. He talks about effeminates being a work of the flesh. And you need to know what an effeminate, uh, an effeminate is. It's a young boy Cat for prostitution. Sorry, it's it's a it's a young boy cat for prostitution. 
but it's also one who dresses like a woman. Now, some, you know, a woman in her right mind wouldn't deliberately want to dress like a man. And likewise, a man in his right mind deliberately wouldn't want to dress like a woman. Because we know if somebody deliberately dresses, and you see it, uh, so a, a movie the other day, and there was a woman in the movie, and it wasn't a woman, it was a man, dressed up as a woman. And this man looked just like a woman. No, something wrong with him. And it's normally because they dress up like a woman because there's something spiritually wrong. And vice versa, they dress up like a man because there's something spiritually wrong. And normally when we find with homosexuality, you normally find the male partner of the two dresses like a man. And I think that's what God is referring to. Amen? A lesbian dresses like a man. They're in a lesbian relationship. And the woman dresses like a man. Hallelujah. So we have to be very careful what we are, that we're rightly dividing the word. Because otherwise, what we're doing, what we're doing makes us worse than we're in the clothes. Because we are then judging people. And if we're not judging rightly, God will judge us, we're in trouble. Hallelujah. So long as, so long as both men and women are, mod, are modest in the... And I spoke, of, I spoke on this on Sunday uh, to get... Because uh, especially people coming behind the pulpit, they need to be very modest in their attire. Amen. Carrying on, verse 15... Chapter Matthew 15, verse 18. But those things which proceed out of your mouth, they come forth from your heart, and they defile you. That is very clear. What come, Jesus said it, what comes forth from your mouth defiles you. And then he said in verse 19, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. So, we don't have to do them, we don't have to speak them, we only have to think them, and we're defiled. Especially if something comes in and you give place to it, instead of, get out of here. It's only when you give place to it that it defiles you. So out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemy. All these things are way worse than wearing the wrong clothing. Because what do they do? They defile you. These are the things which defile a man or a woman. Amen? Now, this teaching is about my undefiled. So if we are doing these things, we're not undefiled, we're defiled. If we think them, do them, what, if they're still in our hearts and not been dealt with, they're defilers. They make us spotted, unclean, hallelujah, before the Lord. Amen? So if we go into Revelation 21, talking about the Bride of Christ, Revelation 21, and in verse 2 it says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her, for her husband. Husband. Now, here, John is saying, he's seeing the new Jerusalem 
And the new Jerusalem, he's saying, is the bride of Christ. And so if we go into verse 9, he said, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come here, come with me, and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. So at this time, at this stage, she's married. The marriage of the Lamb has taken place because he said, I'll show you the Lamb's wife. So the marriage of the Lamb has taken place. And it says, and he carried me away into us in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a, a most precious, unto a stone most precious. So here, the bride, of, the, bride the wife of Jesus, is, is full of light. She's full of the glory of God. And if you, study, if you study Isaiah 60, Isaiah 60 is all about the bride of Christ, the city of God. The whole chapter is about the bride of Christ, the city of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, if we study correctly, rightly dividing the word, we find in Revelation, 20, in Revelation 12 verse 1, it shows a woman, and this woman has the full glory of God on her. And a woman, scripturally, speaks of a church. In this case, it's the church that has been perfected and has married Christ. Because if you read on, you find this woman is with child. So she must be married. Hallelujah. Have a, have a look at the teaching on the br brides of Christ if you want to get further understanding on that. So here, this woman is the city of God. She's glorious. And then if we go into verse 27 of the same chapter, it says, And there shall be in no wise enter into the city of God anything that defiles. So anything where the flesh is having its way in you, you will not be a part of the city of God because you are defiled. The things in your heart defile you. And if you don't get them things in your heart dealt with, you will not be a part of the city of God, the bride of Christ. Amen? Do you understand that? Hallelujah. In Revelation 19, if we go there while we're near the end of the book, Revelation 19, and in verse 7 it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. So in Revelation 21, the marriage, is okay. the marriage has occurred. Here in Revelation 19, the marriage of the Lamb has come. And it says, um, and his wife has made herself ready. She has made herself ready according to what it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, 27. She has been washed by the word of the word. And she is without spot. She made herself ready by washing in the water of the word to be without spot, wrinkle or blemish. So she can be Christ's wife. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In Revelation chapter 3. Did you know that when you get saved, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Did you know that? 
Well, if you don't, you do now. But do you know your name can also be removed from the Lamb's Book of Life? And this tells you so. In chapter 3, verse 4, you have a few names even inside us which have not defiled the garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now, if you go back into Revelation 19, It says, again, the marriage of the Lamb is come. His wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. As long as we spot our garments, we are unrighteous. It's only when the stuff in us has been dealt with that we can truly be righteous, the righteousness of God, and be unspotted and undefiled. Hallelujah. 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 It also says in Revelation 19, Verse 8, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the righteous. Verse 9, and he said unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, again, if you study the word, rightly dividing it, you will find the marriage supper takes place after the wedding. So here, the wedding has taken place and then there's a call goes out for others to come in to be wedding guests. Hallelujah. And if you read Matthew 22, it talks about a man making a wedding for his son. That son being Jesus, the man being God the Father. And it talks about people going out to bid them to come to the wedding and they wouldn't come. They wouldn't come. Because they were too busy doing other things. Some, I've, I've got a, I've got a, a cow that I've got to go with, we, and you know, why, a wife I've got to feed, a wife I've got to look at, I've got a cow that I've got to look at. And they make all kinds of excuses not to be a part of the marriage and the wedding and the, and the bride of Christ. And then it says, you know, and then the wedding guests. Now we find when we study Matthew 25 correctly, and we study that when the marriage of the Lamb has occurred, they, the bride and the groom, they walk to the place of the wedding feast. And on the way, they are met with virgins. These virgins being the wise and the foolish of Matthew 25. And it's only those, only the wise get into the wedding feast. The foolish run out of oil and the door gets shut on them. And they can't get in. The, foot, the wise, they go in as guests. They have missed the wedding. They've missed the bride. And now the, the best thing they can be a part of is be a wedding guest. But even some of them are foolish 
and they've fallen asleep. And sleep is a state of being backslidden in your heart. Hallelujah. We are warned about the days in which we now live in the book of Hebrews. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some will be in the days just prior to Christ's return. And I heard recently that uh, this is a problem I, I have, I've heard over the years in the Assemblies of God Church where people are not, you can leave that on, where people are uh, the word that they are being preached is not a full word to give the people a vision and they, every now and again, they're written, oh, I'll just have a sabbatical. I'll have a rest from church. I won't go to church for the next few months. I'll just have a rest. I've just heard again recently. The first time I heard it was when I was a baby Christian, th almost 30 years ago. And here it is. It's been brought to, it's still happening. It's still happening. People still think having a sabbatical is Christian. Is, is, uh, is scriptural and it is anything but. It's a, it's a mis- it, well, it, it's a deception actually. It's a deception. Amen? So if you read Matthew 25 verse 1 through 13, you find that it's about the marriage of the Lamb. The, the wise go in, the foolish don't make it, the door's closed on them. And, and if you, again, study, the only way the foolish then can get into heaven is literally through the last three and a half years or 42 months, literally have their heads cut off by the beast of Revelation 13. Literally. The only way they can get into heaven is have their heads cut off. The foolish. The foolish, the ones that don't make the bride or our wedding guests. The foolish are the ones spoken of in Revelation 12 verse 17 as being, let's read it, Revelation 12. Revelation 12 verse 17. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant or the remainder of her seed. And if you read in chapter 13, these remnant, these remainder, are killed by the beast. And in Revelation 20 verse 4, it says they have their heads cut off. Literally. And it's all because they don't really want the word. They don't really want to understand and to do the word of God. They do not want the we should be pressing at all times to be undefiled. Not even not even no satisfaction in even being a wedding guest. We've got to be pressing to be a part of the bride of Christ. To be totally undefiled. And everybody said, God bless you.